Good evening, everybody. My name is Sven Rhein, and I'm the president of Lux Real. I welcome our members and guests tonight for our webinar with the title Inbound and Outbound Real Estate Investments between Luxembourg and Poland. We have more than 80 registration for tonight, which is a great outcome because we've got a, a bright sky in Luxembourg, 20 degrees outside, and I can imagine that a lot of you are looking forward to uh, finish the day, maybe outside. Well, we'll keep it uh, as said for 60 minutes and we are happy to have you with us. Maybe two words who we are as Lux Real. And uh, of course, we are very happy that we have this joint event organized with our friends from the Luxembourg Poland Chamber of Commerce. And I will hand over in a minute, just letting you know for those of you who do not know Lux Real, who we are and what we do. So Lux Real is uh, now nearly 12 years old, has been founded uh, uh, that time uh, to organize a platform uh, intersectorial between all the real estate players in Luxembourg. So we are a nonprofit organization covering multiple interdisciplinary sectors in the real estate um, world in Luxembourg, where they are evidently the real estate fund industry. We have developers, architects, engineers, diverse service providers, depository banks, big fours, law firms, tax advisors, and many other consultants. We have around about 100 supporting members among our personal members, which count around 140. So now let me please hand over to my dear um, friend from, uh, the, um, from the chamber of, from the Luxembourg Polish Chamber of Commerce, Arthur. Arthur, the floor is yours to present your association to our guests today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sven. Um, welcome everyone. First of all, thank you for the cooperation the last few weeks we spent together. It was you, Sven, it was Laura, it was Jean-Francois, also from Lux Real and um, Baker McKinsey at the same time. So uh, thanks to the really good exchange we could put into life this event. And as you said, you are 12 years old, we are a little bit younger, and that's why I would like to ask for a small presentation. If Benjamin could just put it on. So we are only nine years old this year. So next year will be a big party and hopefully without mask, without anything. And then we can really celebrate it at the end of 2022. But till then we have another one and a half years and quite a lot to do, a lot of events. So what we have done in the last nine years, we did around 90 events, most of them in Luxembourg, some of them in Poland at the Luxembourgish Embassy in Warsaw. And because why we do it, as our slogan is, we are the business bridge between Luxembourg and Poland. So we do only business events and business events which are interesting for both countries. In this case, it's about real estate, but of course there is the ICT, there's a finance industry, biotechnology, automotive, and, and, and. So when we go to the next page, then you see that in those nine years, we, if I may say like that, collected around 60 to 70 now corporate members. We have also private members. And you see those members are from Poland and from Luxembourg. And we go to the next and the last page. Why do I do the presentation? Because I would love to show you our website, but as one of the three million websites it was also um, the victim of the fire in Strasbourg in France. So we are now working on the new website because we couldn't get it back, but it will come in the next three to four weeks, 100%. It's already there, but it's not finished. It takes time to reestablish a new website. I would like also to invite you to our next online event, which will be on the 20th of April this year, of course, um, will be done with the Luxembourg Chamber of Commerce. And it's about Go International Poland. So for all private and company persons, uh, if you want to know how to do business with Poland, uh, what to expect there, we will have very interesting testimonials. Please join this event. It takes also one hour and 15 minutes on the 20th of April. So once again, thank you, Sven. Thank you, that uh, your Lux Real team. 
for the great work. And now let's start the event. Thank you very much. Yeah, Arthur, thank you for your um, short presentation. Um, now we've told you a little bit who we are and what we do, but before we get really started, we would like to know a little bit about you. Who is the audience and, and why are you here? So we have organized uh, four poll questions uh, where I, uh, Benjamin would kindly ask you if you could throw them to the floor. So the first question is, um, where are you dialing in from? From Luxembourg, Poland or abroad? If you take your vote now would be glad to see what the response will be. Is it open? I guess. We have 30 seconds. Time is clicking. We should get the answers shown immediately right after. So I heard we get some more extra time for you to answer. So out of the 80 registrations, we have 46 participants. What I can see, 20 seconds, 15 seconds. So counting down, I think Benjamin for the next one, we can cut time a bit. So it's a webinar live experience. So what we can see is we have 73% coming in. Ah, we have already the second question answered as well. So what's, what is the result? Um, Luxembourg, 73%, Poland, 18 abroad, even 9%, not bad. Second question was, which country do you currently do real estate business in? So uh, it's really balanced. Uh, it's a balance in, in between both countries, but, and that's really interesting to see is that 18% uh, don't do business, but are still dining in, are interested. And um, we have even 5% who are interested uh, to get started potentially. So interesting to see. I'm not sure if I can scroll down for the next question. I guess I can. So which sector do you represent? We have uh, a lot of service providers, 50%, half of it. Investment manager, 18, investors, nine. No developers, no brokers, some others. Interesting. So what are you expecting from today's conference? 64% get information about the link between Luxembourg and the Poland real estate and more even 77% to know more about the Polish real estate market. That's very good to see for our Polish friends. There is a strong interest and fund setup in Luxembourg, always interesting. And I can tell you with a panel we have organized for today. I hope we get all the answers uh, you are looking for in the time we have. So Benjamin, thank you for the poll. Now it brings us to our first panelist um, to set the scene. Uh, we are really glad to have uh, a representative from several, so the deputy head of the investment consultancy, uh, Marek who is joining today. So to give you a short introduction about Marek, Marek joined Savills in January 2016 as a director in the investment department. Before he worked as the investment director at DTZ and real estate consultancy King Sturge. He has over 17 years of experience in the commercial real estate sector. And during his career, he advised numerous people, numerous Polish and international clients in sale and purchase of commercial properties. Only in recent years, Marek led and successfully closed transactions of a total value exceeding 1.5 billion in various property sectors. So Marek, welcome. Floor is yours. We are looking forward to listen to your setting the floor information about Poland. Thank you, Sven, uh, for the introduction. I have prepared a short presentation. Uh, just uh, 10 minutes should be longer. I'll share that shortly.
Welcome all participants. Uh, a couple of slides about the uh, Polish economy and real estate markets, really in a snapshot to uh, refresh your knowledge uh, or to bring uh, some key facts for those who are not that familiar with the Polish market. All right, let's look, uh, let's look from the uh, macro perspective. What we did, we put together some uh, key information about these two countries, Luxembourg and Poland. And actually what is important uh, is to say that in 2020, both countries appear to be tigers of Europe. Uh, we were, we were the, the, the most, the economies of those two countries were the best performing in Europe. Uh, uh, so it's, it's really encouraging. And uh, also the prospects for 2021 are really good. Um, uh, what's, what's, the, what's the, basically the reason for that? Uh, generally, you know, it's, it's about the stability it's about the size of the economies. Uh, these are really the, the, the key factors. Of course, Poland is bigger in terms of size. We are the fifth largest uh, country in, in Europe in terms of population, sixth largest in terms of GDP in nominal terms. Uh, to give you the numbers, it's like 58, uh, sorry, 580 billion US dollars of GDP versus 69 billion in Luxembourg. But of course, uh, uh, we are jealous about, you know, the per capita numbers. Uh, they're always very, very high and, and they're one of the top uh, in Europe. All right, let's move on. Uh, why Poland is interesting? Why you cannot ignore the country uh, like Poland? Of course, I mentioned the size. So it's about the size of the domestic market. It's about the strategic location. Where Poland is located, for many living in the Western Europe, you would say, in Eastern Europe. Uh, but actually the truth is that Poland is located in Central Europe, which means that we are linking West and East of Europe. And also uh, the Southern countries, we, we provide them the window through the uh, seaports uh, to, to export and import goods from, from around the world. What is the one of the key factors of Poland? Uh, well, it's the size of the country, but it's also the skilled labor force. Uh, this labor force attracts a number of investments, including those uh, in the office sector, but also in the industrial sector and light production. Uh, it's also about the uh, it's also about the uh, cost of this uh, labor force. We are remaining here really competitive, uh, competitive in, in in Europe terms. And infrastructure over the years, you know, uh, motorways, railway system, harbors, all they uh, all were expanding, and right now there, there's really good coverage and very good links uh, to European uh, transportation corridors. Uh, Poland also operates as the, uh, practically the whole country these days as a sort of special economic zone. I mean, the investors, uh, uh, those who want to uh, create the label uh, workplaces, they, they can, they can uh, count on uh, tax relief. So that, that's very important uh, factor as well when it comes to attracting the foreign investments. And just for, for, for the, uh, for the information of those who haven't invested yet, the corporate uh, corporate income tax rate is 90% and capital gains tax as well. Foreign direct investment, last year it was like 10 billion euros. And this is more or less the number that we see in the recent years pretty often, 50, 60 big uh, investments in various sectors, including automotive, uh, uh, including uh, real estate, including uh, various sectors. And you can see the, the, the names from big names from around the world. Uh, so uh, I think that that is important just to, um, to mention a very hot topic of electric vehicles. Uh, perhaps you, you have heard that LG Chem uh, uh, is, is, is building the, one of the largest factory in, in, uh, in the world producing uh, batteries to electric cars. Right now, let's move on to the commercial real estate market. A couple of key numbers. Last year activity, more than 5 billion euro. But of course we experienced drop by 30%. The most uh, traded sector was logistics, warehouses, logistics. The second one was offices. Uh, and it was a change. It was an uh, unusual situation as compared to the previous years. Let's look at the yields. How attractive is investing in Poland? Um, and let's look at the uh, investment activities by sector. So as I mentioned, you know, the uh, most actively traded sector last year was logistics. For the first time, it was nearly, it's constituted nearly 50% of the overall volume. You can see how, the, how it was evolving over years. And it's uh, detronized the office sector, which was responsible for nearly 40% of the overall volume. And of course, what was the key driver was uh, the 
really great uh, growth in the e-commerce, uh, partially driven by by by, uh, by by pandemic, but also uh, uh, by the domestic uh, strong domestic demand. And the other ones, what sort of returns investors can count on in Poland? These are gross initial yields for the prime assets in particular sectors. Uh, so when it comes to uh, when it comes to offices, we are these days at around 4.5, 4.6%. Uh, yields were compressing, but during COVID, they were actually adjusted upward by from 10 to 50 bips. Uh, when it comes to retail, it's closer to 5% these days. Not many transactions happened. When it comes to logistics, 5.5%. But actually, I can say that you know the situation is changing every month, and this is the only sector where actually yields are going south. Uh, and it's uh, well, it's it's amazing what, what we are experiencing. And later on, I'll tell you why it's happening like that. I think it's quite interesting to understand what are the sources of capital? Who is investing in, in such country like Poland? And actually, uh, this is the uh, full spectrum of investors from around the world, depending on the sector. But we can see the uh, investment from the US, from, uh, uh, from other sea countries, so uh, Hungary, Czechia, from Asia. So we see Chinese investors, Singaporean investors, uh, we, we see Middle East investors from Lebanon, for example. Uh, we see Australian, Swedish investors. So we can see practically the whole world investing. Historically, we observe the certain waves of, of, of strong interest, strong, strong activities of, of, of various destinations of capital. So uh, there was the activity, uh, high activity of South African capital, for example, uh, Czech capital. Previously, it was German capital, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But Typically, this is US German capital that is staying here for long uh, and is active uh, most, most often. And on the right hand side, you can see who are the most active uh, investors. Uh, and you can see that, for example, you know, number one and number four, these were the investors from CE. Uh, actually, uh, what we are missing, it's worth mentioning here, is that domestic institutional domestic capital that would be uh, investing in real estate. And actually, because uh, the other CE markets are tiny, are tiny, so uh, actually they found that Poland as an interesting uh, country to, to, to expand their uh, investments and portfolios. Briefly about the office market, it's important for those who are looking at the, uh, and are thinking about the, you know, uh, uh, BPOs, SSC and RNDS activities. Poland attracts them a lot. Uh, and uh, we believe that actually uh, what pandemic causes is, 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 is potentially the, Another way of, 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 of relocations and expanding of such activities uh, because of some challenges in India and, and other countries. So uh, Warsaw market is predominantly CBD central business district and one, two, three, four, these are the city center, uh, small, uh, small districts. So this is where the majority of the stock, modern stock is concentrated. And it's like nearly 6 million square meters of office space. Currently it's like 10% of, of office space that is available immediately available. And the typical rents for the city center are between 22 and 25 euro for non-central locations are between 12 and 15 euro. Office market in regional cities. Uh, Poland, uh, unlike some other European countries, is not only the capital city. It's also uh, a couple of strong regional economic centers uh, and actually, uh, this is where also the office sector developed a lot. Here, one cities are Wrocław and Krakow, and they, uh, they belong to the 1 million square meters plus uh, club. Uh, the others are aspiring, so uh, it's worth mentioning Łódź, Poznań, and Katowice is a very dynamic, uh, and of course, Tri City is a very dynamic region as well. Warehouse market. Well, this one is extremely dynamic. Uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of development, in terms of new supply, we are really one of the leaders in Europe. And this is one of the drivers why there is so many, so many investments. We know that across the Europe, across globe, this is the most sought after sector these days because of massive growth in e-commerce. And actually Poland uh, is benefiting from that situation. There is a lot of development land available, infrastructure is there but also a number of companies expanding. And they are actually servicing domestic market, but that's also Western Europe. So we have a number of uh, Amazons uh, that are growing in a very fast pace, like eight already, uh, to give you a scale. So 20, more than 20 million square meters. And every year these days, we are, you know, every year we are like 10% of the total stock is, is, is being added. 
while actually, uh, as you can see, vacancy rate is, is relatively modest of around 6.5%. And the retail market, well, retail market in terms of development activities is stagnant. I mean, we can see the declining trend over the years. Uh, and of course, it's we know uh, what's the reason. It's, it's about the huge impact of e-commerce of, 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 of selling uh, through internet. So there is less and less uh, uh, development and stock provision. It's relatively modest as compared to Western Europe, more than 300 square meters uh, per thousand of inhabitants, and it's like 12 million square meters. So all in all, uh, just to say that actually in terms of pure real estate market, we have a we have a really deep market, which every year is growing uh, in terms of the new buildings added. So there is sufficient space for investors, sufficient space for space. And this is a really high quality space. The stock is modern, stock is new and fresh and of high quality. So I believe it's an interesting market also when you look at the yields. All in all, it's an interesting market to have a look and to invest. That's all from my side. Thank you. Alec, many thanks for your presentation. Um, we have uh, open questions. We are collecting those questions. So to the audience, please uh, keep going. Uh, we have an uh, answer question section afterward. But I have just one straight question to you. If you maybe can, could come back to slide 10, is that possible? Because there was a remarkable... Sure, sure, sure. Just give me a sec. It was, I think, about uh, sell and acquisition numbers in the market. <clears throat> what was outstanding is that there was, if I... Can you, can you, can you see it now? Yeah, I can see it. Page 10, mm -hmm. slide 10. The yep. US... Do I read right? There was a purchase value and a sale value. Is that right? The blue line is uh, the, the amount of assets. That's right. <clears throat> this is quite explain such a, such a dynamics here. Uh, uh, there is a very simple explanation. The major developer active in Poland is of US origin. It's Panatoni. <laughs> and because okay. they are delivering so much and everything uh, they are selling straight away, <laughs> this is the reason why I actually... US uh, uh, entities are net sellers and actually they are outpace the others. Okay, that explains, yeah, but because sticking out of the regular, um, so I picked my eye. Again, Marek, thank you for now. Uh, we'll have you on the panel afterwards. So that, that takes me now the, to the opportunity to present to you um, a panelist uh, representing a US investment firm, uh, Ward Stocker. So let me introduce you Ward properly. He is a managing director in Europe for acquisition and investment management of LCN Capital Partners. Ward Stocker, um, he oversees uh, investments and asset management for LCN in the UK, Ireland, Baltics, Nordics, and CEE. Ward manages key client relationship and is responsible for the negotiation and closing process of investment transactions. A surveyor by training, Ward has over 20 years of experience in the commercial real estate industry. And between 1999 and 2008, he worked at Cashman and Wakefield, where he spent most of his time leading the office and industrial leasing team based in Budapest. Between 2005 and 2008, Ward was a partner at Cashman and Wakefield and led the CE Capital Markets team. Between 2008 and 2012, Ward worked at King Sturge acquired was King Sturge in 2011 by Jones Lang Nassau, where he was director of SEE Investment. So since 2008, Ward has worked on over 1 billion of single tenant investment transactions across the CEE, Benelux, UK, and Ireland. In addition to his single tenant investment experience, Ward has worked on a further 750 million investment transaction across the CEE. Ward has a bachelor or degree from the University of Aberdeen and is a member of RICS. So I think, Ward, you, you've done the tour. You've seen so many very high-level companies. We are all uh, keen to listen to you as an investment firm. Uh, you are based in London about your experience. So the floor is yours. Please, Ward, uh, 
we are looking forward to hearing you. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Sven, and good afternoon to all members. Um, I'm Ward Stalker. I think Sven has just done my introduction for me, so I'm not sure what else I meant to actually say now. So Sven, thank you very much for that eloquent uh, job. Well done. Um, I've actually lived and worked in Central Eastern Europe um, since 2001, lived there and from 2001 to 2012. And I've been on the both the advisory side and also, sorry, sorry, I'm just going to that off. That's my, sorry about that. I've been involved in the advisory side of the business um, up till 2012. Most recently, I've been working um, with LCN Capital Partners. Now, LCN Capital Partners is not just an investor um, based out of the US. It's got um, European capital also allocated into it. Um, and we invest in single tenant long term income. Across Europe, we've got about six funds. Across the globe, we've got six funds, of which three are in the US and three are in Europe. Um, funds one, two and three, we'll call them, just keep things simple, are in Europe just now. And we have fully spent on fund one and two and are um, just recently closed on fund three. Total amount of investment we've got under management is close to five billion, which is equally split between Europe and the US. Um, now, when I say what well, our strategy is, we tend to orientate ourselves towards sale and leasebacks. Um, so what we can be classified as a real estate and a credit investor. Um, people don't quite know what pocket we are, so they're, we're a bit hybrid. But most, most in, of our investors who come into our funds see us as more real estate based. Um, the type of transactions that we, we've been doing, um, you might have seen recently in the press. Um, in Spain, we did the Mercadona. Um, in, the, in Poland, we've recently done the Cora build to suit. Um, we are just about to close on a transaction tomorrow in the, the um, life science sector in the UK. So we've got quite a diverse spectrum of where we invest and what we invest in. But what I can say to simplify things, we do big box. Retail is a bit like a swear word in the, in the um, investment markets now. It's a bit of a unknown, but we do like the big box retail, which means supermarkets and DIY. We do believe that they're very much recession proof. And we've been doing that investment across Central Eastern Europe recently. Um, and we like offices. Um, People maybe said six, 12 months ago, what's going to happen to the office? I can tell you, people are coming back into the office. If you ask me the question um, again, six months ago, how was the office going to look um, 12 months down the line? I would probably be quite concerned. Um, but actually, the feedback we're getting, you probably maybe have seen a recent report done by KPMG, that we're, the expectation is that the office sector is going to be have very little impact going forward. And the other sector, of course, as Marek was highlighting, everyone is hunting for the warehouse logistics sector. Um, we are one of the US European investors um, in that chart who buys from Pan and Tony. And as Marek said, that's a developer who relies on our capital and other investor capital, pots of capital from the US, from Europe, from Asia, to basically fund their developments once they get the opportunity. So once they come to us with a potential lease contract with the tenant, we forward fund the build to suit on behalf of the developer. And then we become the landlord as soon as the building is handed over. We are very diverse. We, we go anywhere across Europe as long as it's in, within the European Union. Um, and as um, Sven thankfully said, I oversee um, Euro, um, from a European perspective, CEE and the UK and Ireland and Scandinavia. Unfortunately, we haven't had the opportunity to invest in Luxembourg. Um, we would love to, but from our experience, um, it's a bit more of a closed market. It's a bit more of a local market. And I don't mean local, local. I mean local by your neighbours in terms of Benelux. Um, the Belgium entities, the developers tend to come in there like the Codiques. Um, you've also got a lot of number of French investors to come in. So for us, we would like to see if we can do an opportunity. We're actually looking at our first opportunity in Belgium just now, and we're hoping to maybe be successful, but we are competing with, again, local insurance companies in Belgium. And that's important to highlight about our sources of capital in terms of LCN. LCN um, basically has money from Europe and the US and um, the UK, sorry to say that we've left Europe, which I'm very disappointed by personally. Um, but our main source of capital are insurance and pension funds coming into our funds. Uh, but we've also got a number of high net worth individuals who are part of the fund as a whole. Um, 
Now, Luxembourg would be great to do, but it's just a very small controlled market. Whereas in Poland, it's a it's probably, I would say, and Marek can correct me on this later on, I would say it's in the top five investment markets in Europe. I haven't got the, the exact um, take up or, or actually, um, I would say, transaction volumes done in each of the given countries across Europe. But I would say this is in the top five. It's a very liquid market. It's got great diversity of different types of pots of capital. And as time has gone on, it's really matured. Um, it is the, the flagship, the icon, the shining light of Central and Eastern Europe. And not only, I would say, is the, the opportunity of, of um, diversity, so we've got lots of, of um, depth in the market in terms of all, all the sectors, but it's also the skill set of the workforce. So you can see that companies are investing in that economy in a big way. Now, when I was, first went into Warsaw in the early 2000s, late, late 90s, early 2000s, it was quite a dark place. You know, the street lights were pretty dark. The tra- there was a sort of a bit more of a smoky sort of feeling around it. Nowadays, when you go into that into, the, into Warsaw, it's a major capital city. Skyscrapers have been built everywhere, and there's more and more in the pipeline. So what I would say... Going forwards, we see a lot of depth and lots of opportunity in Poland. We would love to try and do something in Luxembourg. If any of these members or your members have got any way that you could help us get into the Luxembourg market, please call me. Um, I'm sure Sven can provide the contact details. And I'm going to leave it for a bit more Q&A because I think Q&A can get much more questions out before I speak too much. So thank you for listening to me. And I'm looking forward to hearing some questions later on. Thanks, Ward. And, and thanks for respecting the time. I think uh, for those who have not known LTN, they know LTN now. And of course, if anybody would be interested that we connect uh, any uh, contacts, please uh, contact us, contact uh, Luxreal via internet, and we're happy to, to get you together. Um, Ward, we will hear more about you at our roundtable afterwards. Thank you for now. And I'm happy to move on to our next panelist. It's uh, Rafael from uh, Reino Capital. So uh, let me share some background information about Rafael. He is the chief strategy advisor of Reno Capital Group based in Warsaw, I understood. Um, uh, he is as well CEO of Neo Management. So Rafael has over 25 years ex of experience in investment management and business development, as well as advisory services in various sectors, including the financial services, real estate, energy, and healthcare. So before joining Reno, Rafael held senior management C-level positions at various financial institutions in the CEE, Munich and Lissabon, uh, no, sorry, Munich and London, including banks, insurance, and reinsurance companies, GE Capital Business, and also AIFMD, regulated mancos. That's what we know in Luxembourg. Rafael holds a BSc in Business Organization and Management from Poznan University of Economics and MA in Hispanic Studies from um, Mikivitic University. Sorry for my pronunciation. Rafael is also founder and member of the board of a nonprofit charity foundation, CHCEMISEE, -E, founding member of Poland's Restructuring Practitioners Association TMA and non executive board member at Poznan Educational Association. He speaks Polish, English, and Spanish. Thank you, Rafael. The floor is yours. Uh, please uh, join our panel. Thank you, Sven, for your very kind introduction. Um, I, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to use this opportunity, having large Luxembourg based audience, and congratulate you on the last weekend victory against Ireland in football um, because you have proved earlier that uh, your fund industry is, is stronger than, than Irish and now you have, you have proved it on the, on the football pitch. Uh, but, but now uh, going back to our topic of today, I, I have uh, set up first structures in, in Luxembourg for Polish investors in, in mid 90s. Then I had um, a uh, significant break when I was working for various uh, different investors in different parts of Central and Eastern Europe. And when I came back to Luxembourg in 2009, it was a completely different world globally, but above all in Luxembourg. It was a completely different uh, industry and completely different city. Since then, uh, I was um, working with a number of Polish investors, creating uh, different 
investment structures in different jurisdictions. Uh, but I would say like 98% of all these structures were located in Luxembourg. For last five years, we are, uh, we are creating investment structures with Reino Capital. And uh, Reino Capital, I owe you a few more words, is uh, investment and asset manager, um, specialized in, um, in various segments of real estate market in Poland. Just to give you some, some feeling within the last few months uh, in the first Q2021, we have closed uh, over 200 million uh, transactions in commercial offices and uh, signed 120 million in logistics, uh, closing in a, in a few days. We are looking into a very robust pipeline in offices, in logistics, uh, but also in residential, in special sites and uh, development all across Poland. Uh, so, uh, so we really believe uh, in Polish real estate market, and we believe at the same time in in uh, structures in Luxembourg. I was asked to share some views from the perspective of Polish investors and for Polish investors. Um, so, from my experience, uh, there are something like four levels or concepts of using uh, funds um, in in various jurisdictions. It is to protect your own capital, to invest into Poland or Polish capital into other jurisdictions, to create JVs or, or SEG accounts or just simply AIF. Uh, and eventually what is we, the, the biggest topic of today to create um, uh, commingled funds, uh, discretionary funds, institutional type of, of product. For all these reasons, Luxembourg uh, offers good solutions in a number of ways. Uh, when we go to create a new investment structure, and although we have used number of times Luxembourg, we always run the same exercise. We are going through analysis for a particular product, and we are ticking the boxes because obviously the external environment might have changed, and this might influence um, the product and the investor base. Uh, we would always start from the structures that are available in the market. Um, so Luxembourg is offering wide range of, of these structures and uh, I will not elaborate too much because I understand uh, Kasia from, from Bakers will, will tell you much more, but it's from all the partnerships through Rife that is my, 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 my favorite for real estate. Uh, to SIF and, and SICAR, and all of these structures may suit well your, your product needs. The taxes, again, uh, I believe Kasia will touch base on, but uh, I would just summarize in, in, a, in a simple sentence. The, the tax structures work very well. They are, uh, they are connected well between Poland and Luxembourg, but what is more interesting for all of us they are, they are working well also with all other jurisdictions. So if you want to blend your capital uh, with, with other investors, the perfect place to do it is, is Luxembourg. For Polish investors, uh, you will appreciate also the legal system is, is critical to where you go with your capital. And Luxembourg offers uh, stability, transparency, stability, and legal system in Luxembourg is proactive in a positive way to all the changes in the external world. So it, it allows you to adapt to the situation very quickly. It is also, uh, which we tend often to, to forget, that EU factor is important because it gives you ability to, to, to passport uh, to other markets and also to, uh, to ensure comparability of your structures based on the directive. Uh, you will also appreciate the regulator in Luxembourg is, is your partner. Yeah, I don't want to dig into too much comparison between Poland and Luxembourg, but in Luxembourg, if you go to CSSF, you may discuss everything in the fight solutions and it's creating a very friendly environment for, for your fund investment. All these formal aspects are very important, but for, for the investors when creating funds and investment structures, I think the most important is that uh, structures and jurisdiction in Luxembourg is perfectly recognized by investors from all around 
the world. Um, and also all types of investors. Uh, or what just uh, showed us why US uh, LCN is going through, uh, through Luxembourg. And our experience also shows that our investors from the US, from Australia, from the UK, all European uh, jurisdiction, but also we have discussed investments like from South Africa, they will all recognize structures and jurisdiction of Luxembourg as a very friendly. This is also uh, critical for the types of investors you may, you may approach. So whether you go to uh, high net, you go to family offices, the institutional investors or conservative investors like pension funds or insurers, they will, they will say yes to the proposal of setting a structure in, in Luxembourg. It also goes without saying that in Luxembourg you will find top quality and large variety of advisors and service providers. You, you can choose from uh, management companies, uh, fund administrators and uh, depository banks that are suitable for your needs and your, for, for your particular product. Um, there are also a number of soft elements that sometimes we are watching as anecdotes. But in 2010, when I, I was running a fund in, in Ireland, there was eruption of Icelandic volcano. I will not dare to repeat its name, but I was to go to a, um, to a board meeting there and I couldn't because all the planes were, were grounded at that time. So I, felt, I thought if I have an option, I will choose a jurisdiction when I can, where I can have alternative way of getting there. And Luxembourg offers this to Polish investors. And actually, I've never done it myself, but I know a number of, of clients of ours that, uh, that used to drive to Luxembourg, uh, sometimes because it's, um, it's easier for them to drive from, from wh wh wherever they live, but sometimes maybe they just want to bring more model wine with them. Uh, there are also um, some, some other factors uh like like the fact that there's a growing uh polish speaking community in luxembourg i'm not saying it is a critical element in all of that but it's it's good if if you can meet polish speakers and people with the cultural similarity to uh to polish experience and then it may open some some gates or it can solve some some problems um Eventually, I, I would draw attention to some aspects that might be interesting for everyone that, uh, that wants to consider setting up a fund. It's not anything particular for Luxembourg, but it's something I'd like to draw your attention to. So the growing importance of local substance, the uh, growing um, AML pressure, which is, which is in each and every market, but it may take the uh, opening simple bank account uh, longer, so so have it uh, have it um, planned well in your processes, and uh, and as well, uh, please mind the new rules in pre-marketing and reverse solicitation because for some investor it might be a game changer. Thank you. So that for me from me now, I will be happy to open some to to answer some questions later. Great, Rafael. Many thanks. Um, it's always good to hear from a practitioner or from a testimony who already applies uh, the Luxembourg toolkit uh, to steer uh, funds via Luxembourg into target investments. Um, we are looking forward to have you on the panel afterwards to elaborate further uh, with some other questions. Bring me now to my next uh, dear panelist and presenter of today. It's Kasia from Baker in uh, Poland. Um, so let me hit quickly introduce Kasia. Find my right paper. And I can help you with that. I think that I can quickly introduce myself Super. as a tra transactional lawyer, and I think it will be quick and and uh, very accurate for uh, for what I do. So in Baker McKenzie, uh, we combine a global approach and global coverage with local expertise. And actually, this is why uh, we are the advisor of choice of many, many investors coming into Poland to uh, invest in the Polish real estate market. They are from all over the world, but uh, recently I've heard uh, from uh, some of them 
a statement, a quote, I give you a quote and we can leave it for further discussion whether this is true or not, that when you manage to close one deal in Poland, actually you're capable and ready for closing deals in any other part of the, of the world. And this sentence, this quote is supposed to reflect the complexity of the, of the transactions in Poland. And this is for further discussion. I wonder what would be your, uh, your assessment on that. But I can say one thing that when these investors do deals uh, through with intermediary of Luxembourg, usually these deals go smoother because the structures and the legal solutions that are being used are well tested. And this is because uh, right now Luxembourg, in my experience, seems to be the, the leading location for holding companies, for holding platforms for the, for the real, real estate investors from all uh, sides of the world. We are working with uh, EU investors, but equally with Korean, Malaysian, from Philippines, uh, from uh, Middle East. And the vast majority of them use uh, Luxembourg as the gateway to, uh, to Poland and gateway to other EU countries. Uh, Rafa already mentioned a number of reasons why it is, it is happening. Uh, the obvious reason is that uh, Luxembourg is an EU member and suddenly when you are a foreign investor from outside the EU, you using the Luxembourg platform, you uh, can suddenly benefit from all the advantages that are uh, available also for the, for the EU investors. And that makes the life of investors much more uh, easier. Secondly, I have to say that uh, Luxembourg has a surprisingly comparable legal system for the legal system in Poland. So when you have a certain type of company, a certain type of a fund platform in Luxembourg, you can find the equivalent instance and, and understand uh, what kind of structure is being used and uh, what and assess the, the, the implication uh, of a given deal. And uh, another thing is that Luxembourg is very much, or Luxembourg uh, authorities are very much uh, catching up to the recent developments in the, in the tax court. This is also uh, already mentioned by uh, Rafał that uh, the substance requirements, uh, the discussion on BEPS erosion and profit shifting, and uh, the discussion on uh, combating uh, tax avoidance schemes, these are very relevant topics for the, uh, for the investment industry. And uh, Luxembourg authorities are very much taking care about the um, appropriate environment, uh, tax environment being adjusted to, to this climate. As a result, from the Polish perspective, Luxembourg is not being perceived as uh, any kind of a tax haven, uh, but, but rather a, a standard holding location. And this is not necessarily the case with respect to that typical um, uh, to, to, to the other typical holding locations like like, like Cyprus. I cannot say that uh, that we can apply this uh, this perception to, to, to Cyprus. Also the other typical uh, holding location from the Polish perspective, which was Holland, is losing attractiveness because of uh, increasing complexity of legal regulations in, uh, in Holland, making it less and less suitable uh, for location of of, uh, of holding platforms. So from, from this perspective, uh, for the investors coming into Poland and wanting to, to invest into Poland, uh, Luxembourg seems to be a perfect uh, gateway and is really getting more and more uh, interest and, uh, and uh, attractiveness. And these are hard, uh, hard facts. 
And uh, coming back to the to the opening question, uh, I wonder, uh, and I, I will gladly uh, discuss it with you, whether Poland is so difficult to to close the deals from a, from a legal perspective. That definitely the other thing that I'm hearing about Poland is the high quality of all the advisors. So even if there are very complex matters to be addressed, you can find a workforce that is very capable to 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 help you to and lead you through through these matters. So that will be from my side. Thank you very much, Sven, handing back to you. Thank you, Kasia. Very on the spot and very efficient. Uh, looking forward to discuss further questions in our roundtable. I'm conscious of time. I'd like to move on with our last uh, speaker for today, uh, our Luxembourg content we bring to the table. Um, thank you, Prismila, from uh, Royal Partners to join us. Maybe to shortcut time as well. If you would like to present yourself in your company, uh, um, I'm, I'm glad to, to leave you the floor, please. Okay, thank you, Sven. So in the interest of time, very briefly, we are Ransom Partners and oh, we have two businesses. We, we um, manage funds as, as a GP and the second line of business, which we developed several years ago, we started and now, now developing is uh, third party AFM uh, operating out of Luxembourg. I have been with, with Ray Alton for 20, three years, so it's quite a long time, so my CV doesn't include much else than, than, than Royalton. Uh, and to move, moving to the, to the point, I think you learned quite a lot why to invest via Luxembourg and why to invest in Poland. I think it would be good to tell you in, in well, I have probably five minutes, so not, exclu not uh, in full scope, but at least a bit how to do it. Because it's when you, you have had your initial meetings or you may remember them, uh, I would say that Luxembourg is proud of its toolbox, and rightly so, but the first glance at, at, at this toolbox and multi, uh, multiplicity and, and um, number of various acronyms and fund structures and corporate structures uh, is sometimes a headache for non-primed um, reader or, or listener to, to presentations by lawyers. Uh, but it, there's a purpose in it. And I think for you to not get lost, what I could advise is to um, have one uh, leader in Luxembourg who would be a sounding board and be able to comment on various questions you may have while discussing uh, your venture with, with all the service providers. As uh, my predecessors mentioned, the, the, the market for providers in Luxembourg is very broad, it's very competitive. You may think the, the, the services are not cheap, but they are as cheap as they can be because of the competitive pressure, we are not able to offer too high, high prices. On the other hand, we have to comply with all the regulations and that's what we provide to you. We, we give you assurance that um, as local service providers, your venture, your fund will be always compliant and uh, you will not have any problems with, with um, uh, the local regulators or with regulators elsewhere. So going back to the, to the basic of the, of the toolbox, to set up the fund in Luxembourg, you, you basically need three uh, three uh, service providers to help you operate the fund on a daily basis. And this is administrator, depository, and AIFM, if the fund is supposed to be AIFM compliant. Uh, and between those three providers, the fund will be operating. And, and the quality of cooperation between them is, is the, the key for success of smooth running of the fund. Of course, in addition, you will need also an, an auditor and, and, and legal law firm, but uh, kind of daily operations, daily phone calls will be mostly to those three providers. So I think uh, from the, the investor's point of view, the, the fund sponsor's point, fund point of view, uh, the selection of those providers is crucial. And I think it's good to meet several of them and, and check how they work together because uh, going forward, that will be uh, your, your daily um, either headache or relaxing relationship with, with people who are who knows what they are doing and who can deliver on time and, and without mistakes. Uh, going a bit down the structure, um, we all understand that, that the regulatory problems are not, uh, you know, sub, the, 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 what drives investors. We are, uh, we understand we are in the background, we are supposed to deliver uh, as smooth running of the structure as possible with as little interaction with you as, as possible to let you focus on your investment activities, finding deals, negotiating, closing, and managing transactions. Uh, and in practice, the, 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 
ecosystem in Luxembourg is, is um, designed to deliver this. So we are um, as much as possible trying to source data between ourselves, not ask you that too much. Um, the, the AIFM, if you, if, uh, you are familiar with the AIFM, um, probably you are since many of you are from Luxembourg, AIFM regulation requires certain regulatory, regulatory uh, functions to be performed by the, by the manager, and that's what, what AIFM is doing. We, we as, as licensed AIFM, we can offer you all those uh, regulatory uh, requirements which are uh, required by the law. Uh, so the, the involvement of the fund manager, of the sponsor of the fund, in, in this kind of administrative uh, part of the business will be limited and they can rely on, on, uh, on the Luxembourg um, providers to take care of it. Um, so I guess that's about it. My, my advice when you come to Luxembourg and, uh, and start your, your, your journey with, with Luxembourg um, ecosystem is to find someone whom you trust, you speak the same language, the chemistry works, and whether it's, it's AFM or administrator of, or, or depository lawyer or auditor, they will choose kind of leader and and uh, uh, guide within this the labyrinth of of uh, Luxembourgish legal system, and over time you will learn yourself and and be more um, firm in in your decisions. But I, I understand the early days, and from my experience with clients, those early days are always difficult, and and they come to us as a kind of sounding board, checking various concepts where they are not not sure, and, and we are very happy to do it as well as all the colleagues in Luxembourg from, from uh, the service, service provider community. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Semina, for your insight uh, related to the service as a Manco in Luxembourg. I think already a lot of knowledge was shared by each individual speaker. Thank you for that. Now, uh, I look at time conscious, but nevertheless, we'll have a short round table where we will try whether we can unlock further information from you by dedicated questions. Uh, let's start uh, with, with Marek. And Marek, I take the opportunity to pick up one question from the floor, which was, uh, what will be the result of COVID for the office market? Uh, will there be a consolidation that A locations will absorb more B location tenants as more space and A locations will be available? Do you feel fine to answer to that question, Marek, from your point of view? You are new sure, just, are just, just very briefly, <clears throat> purely from the po Polish perspective, I mean, especially from the Warsaw's perspective. I mean, only to, to, to the extent, I would say, because there is a clear pricing gap between the central locations and non-central locations, so A and B locations. Uh, and uh, because both, uh, both actually, uh, both uh, market segments will be affected, there will be some pressure on rents going forward, as, and it's already visible then I believe uh, it won't be a massive move. Basically, those who selected B locations, they did it on purpose because of, you know, price uh, difference. Okay, so you don't see a major impact of COVID related to the market? I mean, of course, there is the impact on market, but it equally, you know, uh, affects both market segments, both A class and B, B class. So uh, it's not that obvious, and of course, uh, that, that actually, you know, uh, the... Uh, uh, both locations, both both both, both uh, market uh, segments are, behave, are are actually subject to pretty much the same factors. Okay, I would just I would just um, like to just jump in there. Sorry, Marek and Sven. I would just say, you know, in terms of the office sector in Warsaw, that I'm sorry, Marek, I'm talking very very helicopter view here. Um, there's quite a large development pipeline coming through, which I believe will increase the vacancy. I know that there's been very, very strong demand and we are looking at one of the, the big um, single tenant deals done by Skanska with the insurance company, a large transaction coming in hopefully later this year. I'm not sure if you're going to be the sales agent or not, but you know there is quite a pipeline. But what I would say is that there is a lot of tech companies looking at um, Poland and Warsaw. My recommendation for anyone wanting to orientate themselves to the market is what I would say to anyone, flight to quality. When you go for quality and there's a hit in the market, you usually are in a more protected position. The sectors that tend to get more hit in an impactful point is more the secondary markets because then the vacancy actually does really impact that area. So if you maintain the quality, go for best in class and make sure you've got a good advisor such as Marek 
and such as cash are there. Really impressed with what you guys had to say. I think you'll be okay entering the market because it is key. There are downfalls when you go into the market, but I'm not. I'm going to stop there because I'm going somewhere else. So sorry, sorry, Mara. <clears throat> If, I fully agree with from the investor's perspective, definitely. If I am to make an investment recommendation, that's the thing. It's more about the, you know, how the tenants may potentially behave. Yeah. yeah. And, and Mark, what, what sectors would you expect to be the most popular among the real estate investors in, in 2021? I mean, we see uh, strong logistics. It's not a secret. Over. It's just a continuation of what we saw in 2021. It's already see, it's already visible through, you know, equity rising. Uh, the most, uh, uh, you know, Many funds are rising equity for, for just logistics uh, or uh, you know private rental sectors. So definitely, these two will be the most actively traded sought after by investors. In particular, the you know warehouse and logistics fundamentals are still very strong. Although, no pricing is becoming very demanding. That that that's the thing. And the ge geography remains the same, or do you say a change in trend? Yeah, I mean, pretty much the same. I mean, in Poland, we will have still a lot of development activity and strong demand should be there. So uh, where the product is, especially in that sector, uh, also investors uh, will appear. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Marek. Um, coming back to, to you, Ward, um, as a US headquartered real estate investor, why did you choose Luxembourg as your fund base for investing in Europe? Uh, you could have chosen or compared maybe to, to Ireland or our other big competitors. Why is it Luxembourg? Is it investor driven or what's your call on that? Well, you know, being half Irish, of course, I would like to have seen us potentially go to Ireland. But I've got to say, you know, we like to be, be seen, be perceived as being a pan-European investor. And it's very important then to be on the continent. And I mean the continent of mainland Europe. As um, was picked up, I uh, can't remember who was actually saying it, um, but one of our distinguished speakers, Raphael, I think said it, you know, it's nice to be able to, if we do have a meltdown and we can't actually travel, that we can actually get in our car and drive. And Luxembourg is actually very approachable from both the UK and most parts of, of, of Europe. Now, I think the main criteria reason is that it's a recognized location. So for our investors, Luxembourg is a tick in the box, it's approved, it's very much regulated, which again is a tick in the box by the global world that we're working in. And I would say finally is the, is the skilled work set, uh, workforce. Now, it was also picked up in, uh, by our my fellow uh, partner here, uh, Ralton, who we work with on AFIM, um, that you know, the workforce costs are going up considerably. And now when that happened with the service providers, we actually decided to set up our own office, not only for the reason that we got to the critical size that we could afford having our own office, but we still have Ralton there for us. And they are a part of our, our, all our funds. They work with us. We've got our own office of um, six to seven people. And then we've got Royalton there as well. And it is absolutely key for anyone who's looking to maybe set up an operation in Luxembourg, make sure you get your correct advisors. We've got certain law firms that we deal with, certain accountancy firms, because when transactions go through, and Casha will know this more than anyone, you need to make sure at the hold call, the whole team system is working. Otherwise, that could actually destroy the, the potential acquisition or disposal that you're trying to do. Yeah, good, good, good to hear that uh, before you do your own mistakes. But this brings me, maybe let's get Rafael into the game here. Rafael, uh, what would you recommend, recommend an investor um, planning to set up a fund in Luxembourg? What is a very cumbersome process? I mean, it's fast day-to-day -day business in Luxembourg to service and to set up funds. But what would you say would be the right process? Which uh, service providers or third parties to go and identify first? And what have you learned uh, by doing that in your past experience? Yes, I would associate largely with what Shamek have said earlier. But uh, first of all, I have your guide, someone who, who is experienced in such a process. Uh, it's always never move into something new without your trusted lawyers and other advisors. And in Luxembourg, I would still probably uh, go to management company, to, to, uh, to AFIM. Because all the all the paths in 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 fund environment they are crossing that, so they will let you know uh, for your product what you really need, what reporting standards, what uh, what, what risk profiles, and and what sort of uh, uh, other service providers it would be best to work with. So that would be my route. Okay, and now talking to to a manco um, uh, at Royalton, what would you say? How long it would take to set up a fund? If you had, if now somebody would knock at your door and say, "Hey, I would like to set up a fund," what would be realistic? What could you advise, Prism Love? Uh, well, I think you know the, 
I mentioned the, the Luxembourg toolbox, and this toolbox is being upgraded uh, all the time to be to be modern and responsive. So Luxembourg created a number of fund structures which don't require uh, prior approval by the by the regulator, which shortens the time to market substantially. So as all people in Luxembourg know, we have we have structure called Drive, which is um, which can be set up just by by signing legal agreements. It requires to be managed by AIFM, but on the other hand, it doesn't does not require to be uh, approved by CSF. So there, this lead time does not exist. So really, the time to 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 um, put the market up is I would say well, uh, it's always people are always you know uh, trying to be to be um, optimistic and say we can do it in in three weeks. But I think in real time is more like three months because you have to draft legal agreement. You have to line up all the service providers, sign all sorts of agreements, which you know the, the, the sponsor usually doesn't have much experience reading. Uh, so I think three months is is uh, is realistic time from let's say the first discussions to the day when the, when the final documents are signed. Um, although I would say in in practice it may take a bit longer, but there is no no issue of of waiting for approvals. No, uh, all, all this time can be. Can be um, uh, predicted and and estimated. There are no no longer unpredictable waiting times and 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 uh, open-ended uh, situations. Everything every step can be designed and uh, managed properly. So this three months time, I guess, is it's somewhat achievable. Okay. And as a manco, well, you are the manager per se for the fund, uh, but uh, you are have a lot of interaction with other service providers, which have been mentioned, like the depot banks, the central administrator. What is your role and what is your involvement? Involvement maybe in the setup process. Are you already involved or are you more involved? And uh, what is it uh, in the ongoing fund life related to the relationship? Well, at, at the setup, it depends, you know, whether we are this lead, lead provider or not. But if, if, we, if we are, um, we try to, sometimes we try to find other service providers if someone is really new to Luxembourg, he, he doesn't know the market very well and we have much better uh, understanding and knowledge who, who is there. Uh, so we, we sometimes line up all the providers uh, who will work for the fund and then uh, cooperate with them to put together fund documentation, the fund agreements, to put together service agreements and, uh, and then lead the, lead the sponsor to, to uh, let's say the first closing or, or signing of the legal document. Okay. Yeah, it's a predefined process. I think uh, the professionals who do fund launches day by day, they, they work hand in hand, uh, establish the optional memorandum where relationships and uh, responsibilities are, are, are defined and, and ring-fenced. But now it's all about cost as well. Uh, maybe Rafa, from your point of view, um, w what's your view on, on uh, uh, the affordability of Luxembourg structures for Polish investors? Do you have a view at comparison and experience related to that? Well, Luxembourg is not cheap, but we are talking about real estate. And if, if, if someone talks about real estate, it's big figures. So it, it is affordable, but you need to remember um, facts that were mentioned earlier. So there is a var variety and big selection of uh, service providers and advisors. You need to choose the one that is appropriate for, for you and for your product. Um, uh, and, uh, and above all, uh, you need to have your process and your product well uh, thought through in advance because there is nothing worse like going in circles and spending probably twice as, as much money as you could if, if it's well designed and, uh, and uh, well guided. And uh, for Polish investors, do not compare with uh, Polish uh, closed-ended funds because you're, you, you get what, what you are paying for. As Ward said, there is a quality of, uh, of, of people in, in Luxembourg and you, you need to pay for this quality and also for the, uh, for the range of services you receive in exchange. Right, yeah, it's, it's not all about pricing, but I think the fact that Luxembourg is, after the United States, the biggest leaders for fund administration in the world and the biggest in Europe, uh, it can't be all about price. It has, it has to work. And I think uh, there's a proven track of many years even in crisis, it works. Now, I would like to move back a little bit now. A uh, question to Kasia. So I heard, um, is it true that Poland recently introduced regulations actually preventing shared deal transactions covering Polish commercial real estate? 
Kasia, can you maybe elaborate on that question? Yes, sure. This is actually the example how the gossip spread, because in fact there was new regulation, and this regulation in fact regards as a share deals, but uh, it is not about uh, preventing the share deals. Uh, this regulation is about it. Firstly, what it doesn't, uh, what it isn't. Uh, it is not a new tax, it does not impose any new uh, taxation uh, on uh, share deals. It actually changes the way capital gain tax is be on share deals is being collected. So uh, implementation of this regulation and somehow adjusting to this new regulation just requires from the parties to the transaction being a share deal to reflect uh, in appropriate way in the sale agreement the fact that this, this regulation was, was introduced. But the economic burden of, of tax is unchanged as it used to be before this uh, regulation was, was introduced. So yes, we need some changes in a contractual framework of uh, share deals, but this is not about any additional burden uh, that of taxation that may be imposed on the parties. So you can go for share deals and close the transactions this way, and uh, there should be not, no obstacle to, uh, to do it this way, and the right lawyers should help you to ensure uh, the security of the transaction, even with this new regulation being in Force. Thank you. Another last question to you. Is Poland finally introducing the legislation for real estate investment trusts? Any update on that? Hopefully, yes. Uh, Rafa is smiling because he's very involved into the initiatives. Actually, there were already two attempts uh, to introduce a uh, legal regime for real estate investment trust. Right now, there are very intense work and lobbying. Uh, so I can call it a third attempt. I hope this uh, this time it will be it will be successful and uh, yeah the, the polish market is waiting for this regulation very much because uh, we are most likely very much aware that the share of polish investors on the polish uh, in the polish real estate uh, market is, is is very low and uh, due to in the environment of low interest rates or even negative interest rates, uh, the stimulus uh, in the form of a new investment platform to, to stimulate the flow of funds from the from a bank deposit to, to, to the real estate market is very much required. And this is why we hope that, that this time this, uh, this lobbying activity and this discussion with the government will be successful and this regime uh, will be will be introduced. I know I, I'm part of two uh, groups that are very uh, active in, uh, in this area and there are very intense um, discussions between the representatives of the industry and the representatives of the Polish uh, Ministry of Finance in order to introduce respective regulations and the legal framework for the platform. So let's hope that it is going to happen in 2021. Good, that sounds like promising. Uh, thank you, Kadia, for that. Um, we have all but drawn already. I would like to closely come to an end with a final question to all of your panelists. Um, it is about um, having lived through the pandemic crisis now over the last 12 months. What is your personal expectation related to your business for the next 12 months? Is it rather pessimistic? stable or optimistic and why? Maybe Marek, uh, can I kindly ask you to start uh, the answer before we pass on to any other panelists, please? Sure. <laughs> optimistic. <laughs> why? <clears throat> I mean, you know, we are coming to an end of, of uh, COVID saga. It's already visible. People want to, uh, people want to enjoy life, but also people want to invest. Money, money is not a problem. Uh, so it's, it's about the limitation that we're experiencing now. So I am really expecting and I see that there will be a much more activity, especially starting in the second half of the year. Thank you. On that positive note, uh, Prismilov, I see you next on my screen. Uh, what would okay. you like to share? Well, I, my, my outlook is also positive. You know, we are in, in the investment business, fund management business is long term business. Once you have a fund, the fund is running for 10 years and you have, if you have institutional investors, they are reliable and they have enough, they, they usually have money to, to uh, 
contribute to the fund. So, okay, COVID was, was a difficult year. We had to relocate, but from the business point of view, I would say we, we gained more, less of new clients, but we expanded our business with, with existing clients. So I expect this, this trend to be about, about a bit more mixed in 2021 and, and back in, in normal times in 22. Yeah, thank you. That was a word from Luxembourg. Uh, Ward, what's um, your view? Optimistic. Um, you know, we've been doing year on year in, in Germany and Poland, 50 to 100 million. Uh, we'll end up doing 100 million tomorrow, probably. Uh, we're about to close a big transaction. My one concern is the interest rates. I don't think they can go much further south. So I think people should start to be a bit careful uh, in what they're doing. And Luxembourg is just growing. It constantly grows. And it's a bit like Warsaw in Luxembourg. There's more and more office buildings going up every single day. So I'm feeling very positive about things. Um, and I think there's a big weight of capital. And I'm sure Savills will highlight that. Um, sitting on the doorstep, waiting to get on planes and start traveling again. Once that weight of capital starts traveling, there's more money out there spending. Great. I mean, I can see you sit on the sunny side already of life, so <laughs> wish, wish the best to continue. I'm looking forward to my gin and tonic. <laughs> Thank you, Ward, for that. Rafael, please, uh, what's your view? Well, our view is also very positive. It's, it's our experience with, with investors. They, they, they want to come back. They want to invest. It's also what all these surveys are showing. Uh, so probably, again, I would associate it with, with what Przemek said, uh, end of this year, beginning of next year, uh, everything coming back. And also, um, people and businesses are creative. So even now, if people cannot travel, we use drones to see the, um, the assets and uh, you know, to, just to have business going on. Um, so we, we are finding uh, responses to all the challenges. So I'm positive. Thank you, Rafael, for that. Last but not least, uh, Kasia, what's your view? I think that if you ask this question to, to this panel a year ago, the answers would be completely different. We were after two first weeks in Poland of, of lockdown and everybody was uh, kind of terrified of what was going to happen. And uh, the fact that we are answering this question uh, a year later this way it proves incredible resilience uh, of the industry. And uh, I believe that this is a, a great basis uh, for, for further optimism. And due to that, I'm, I'm also very optimistic about, about the market, about the investment prospect, and uh, about the recovery of Polish economy and European economy in general. Yeah. Well, I thank you all. I think um, for me personally, it feels so good to hear the optimism after we listen to the radio, to the news, and you take away a lot of pessimism and threat and all of that, but uh, it was not coordinated this question that you answered all the same on a positive note. I, I hope you take this positive note all with you tonight when you go home or if you are home already. I really want to thank uh, my dear panelists for all of your contribution. I hope uh, we created some appetite for those who would like to come to Luxembourg and to invest, in po invest into Poland or to invest into Poland. You have the names, you have the contacts, so please, if you have any questions left, contact them directly or us. I want to, to close with a big thank you again to all of your panelists. I want to thank as well to the Luxembourg Polish Chamber of Commerce, um, Arthur and your team for the great preparation and for the great yeah, uh, organization in that context. Um, if you are interested, stay tuned, stay tuned with both, with both associations. And uh, we uh, wish you, uh, dear guests and members, that uh, you had a, a pleasant one hour and 20 minutes with us and still enjoy this lovely weather. We have a Luxembourg, but I see the sun as well in London. So the so thanks goes to our supporting members here on the screen now. Um, we are uh, looking at new um, opportunities of webinars. There will be one coming up uh, about text uh, jointly with Deloitte. So if you are connected uh, or follow us on LinkedIn, you will be tuned what's going on. And the same, I think, is for the Luxembourg Chamber of Commerce. Yeah, so thank you all and uh, goodbye for now. And I'm much looking forward, hopefully in the future, uh, in a personal meeting to see you all again. Bye-bye for now. Bye.
Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.